Now, some of the arguments I heard against observed instances of speciation is that speciation takes millions of years. Aren't we supposed to be over with this one? No? What do you mean, no? Oh. There's another part. And I promised. Oh, for crying out loud. <sighs> no, I don't... Okay, oh, alright, alright. Now, some of the arguments I heard against observed instances of speciation is that speciation takes millions of years. No, just no. I don't know any kind of scientist that claims that. And I don't know any kind of person that claims that. I don't think... I couldn't find anything on nature.com that would indicate that speciation takes millions of years. So, where did you get this number? Was it written in the same paper that you managed to find that mutation ratio? I'm just guessing. Therefore, we can observe it. For example, speciation in, in mammals is, is thought to take, for example, 5 million years. Again, where the hell did you get these numbers from? This here is Canis lupus familiaris, also known as domestic dog. This too is Canis lupus familiaris, also known as domestic dog. And can these two species mate? No, I didn't think so either. Yes, it's possible to make them artificially, but naturally, these two won't mate. Therefore, we can observe directly speciation. Whoever said that we cannot observe speciation? But 99% of all species is thought to be extinct. Therefore, the number of all species exist existing on Earth now and in the past is more than 100 million species. Now, life began 3.5 billion years ago. Therefore, uh, therefore, dividing 3.5 billion by 100 million means that the average, on average, every 35 years, a new species must have evolved on Earth. Thank you so much for this high-level mathematical input, but um, I don't know how to tell you that, but it has absolutely nothing to do with any kind of biology or evolution. Especially since evolution doesn't work on linear time scale. Now remember some species have a generation time of only a few days. For example, fruit flies. We can artificially select fruit flies to speed up speciation by exposing them to artificial evolutionary pressure and expose them to mutagenic substances. If you do not observe speciation in organisms with a short generation time, how are we to expect speciation in mammals and humans when their generation time is thousands of times longer? Now here is a dang good question that I want to ask you. If you don't know what evolution is, how do you know what evolutionary pressure is? The speciation has not been observed and people that claim it has been observed are, re are misrepresenting our research. Well, if they have managed to, you know, I did the research, did it more research than you do. Ooh, psychedelic. What is it? Oh no. It's the second part. Oh yeah. Give me five minutes. I have to buy some aspirin. Hey everyone, this is the second part of my video. In this video I'll show you using scientific evidence that there are no observed instances of speciation. I might start sounding like an ass, but Everything that you prove, it's that you cannot read scientific literature. All of the studies that I cite in this video are available online and can be referenced using Google Scholar or Medline. And rather than spending 5 minutes giving you all the links in the description box or in the video, he's just telling you, JUST FUCKING GOOGLE IT! Now reading this website for a while made me realize that the scientific standards displayed on the site are extremely poor. The site is biased, it's misleading, and it should not be used by anyone interested in intellectual honesty. Yes, people, you heard the man. Let's stop using talk origins altogether and rely on much, much better sources. Like, I don't know, Mr. Does It at Up 11's video channel? So let's rely on his intellectual honesty and do the stuff that he does. Namely, don't do any kind of research, because that's much too much effort. I have a background in both in research science and in medical science. From a personal experience, I believe medical science is more evidence-based. And while we're at it, 
let's misrepresent data because, well, nobody will bother to check anyway. Uh, in the Middle Ages, 99% of scientists thought the Earth was at the center of the universe. Let's stop reading peer-reviewed papers. Or even better, let's stop linking peer-reviewed papers so that nobody will know where we got that data from. The human chromosome undergoes mutation at a constant rate of 1 times 10 to negative 3 substitutions per site per million years. And of course, I saved the best for last. If you are unsure about the data matching your worldview, just make something up. Because that is the peak of intellectual honesty. The chance that this process produces a hormone gene is 1 over 782 sextillion. 917 trillion something. The number one cited example of speciation is Drosophila paulistorum. Not to, to quote from Talk Origins. Uh, this is a direct quote. Two strains of Drosophila paulistorum develop, developed hybrid sterility of male offsprings between 1958 and 1963. Basically, in this research, fruit flies were bred, and the males of the resulting organisms could not mate with the original population. The females could still breed with the original population. Thus, it was termed an incipient species, that is, a species in formation. Uh, the study says, and I'm, I'm quoting directly, the process of speciation has evidently been completed. So, to me, um, this sounded at first like an observed instance of speci speciation, and it was time to accept the, the theory of evolution. Well, I think I'm going to be a little bit skeptical about that statement because you have proved that you have no idea what theory of evolution actually means. You have no idea what theory in science means. So, yeah. I became skeptical, however, when I noticed that the new species was not given a new species name. And the research was from the 1950s, 60s and 70s. I searched a bit on Google Scholar and this is what I found. The research quoted on the website is obsolete. I really don't know how to tell you that, but no, no it isn't. The original research is from the 1950s, 60s and 70s. There has been new research done in 1981. This new research that you are talking about is 30 years old and no, it's not considered to be new. That showed that the inability of the males of the new population um, to mate with the females of the original population was not due to change in genetics. Rather, it was due to a transfer of an infectious organism which caused sterility in the males. The original research on nature.com is still $32, so it's a little bit pricey for me. It's not like a god would just whoa, 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 that's awesome, dude. You're welcome. Where did you get this magic from? David Copperfield. Oh, thank you. You're welcome, man. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This just occurred to me. Rather than opening a Wikipedia page and finding out that there is more than one way to determine new species, but rather than spending like Five, about five minutes on a Wikipedia page. You just go around and saying, "Yeah, well, speciation is not true because uh, there is bacteria in uh, Drosophila polystorum." It's like that bacteria completely invalidates any kind of evolutionary theory or maybe even speciation. No, no, it doesn't. Thank you again for showing your intellectual honesty and completely ignoring the rest of the paper. Especially the part where it talks about genetic changes and mating preferences. Have you ever heard about allopatric speciation? If you didn't, go look it up. The second most commonly cited example of speciation is Onothera gigas, which is a species of the evening primrose. Now what is interesting about this is that the species was actually given a new name in, the, in this example, a species of the evening primrose named Onothera lamarckiana, uh, formed a new species and was, was renamed to Onothera gigas. Now this is what Talk Origin says. A plant species, after doubling its chromosome, could no longer interbreed with its parent species and was, and was named Onothera gigas. 
Well, once again, after having read this, I thought, oh well, it's time to accept the theory of evolution. But, um, I noticed that the research was actually from 1907, so I looked on Google Scholar. And this is what I found. The research I found was published in the Journal of Heredity, which is a journal of the American Genetics Association. Two quotes from the study. Um, De Vries, who was the Dutch researcher who discovered this plant species. Anyway, De Vries also discovered a robust variant of Onotera Lamarckiana, he named Onotera gigas. Later shown others uh, to be polyploid. That bred true without any sign of reverting to the original type. De Vries thought that A, each of these mutations represented a different elementary species, and B, De Vries also thought that all Onotera mu uh, mutants were produced by a common mechanism. Both of these ideas, A and B, were later disproved by other geneticists. Are you going to paste one or two statements before that? No? Well, you're right about that. Intellectual honesty and everything. So, let me paste it. The written that each of these mutations represented a different elementary species. In 1901-1903, he published his theory that new species originate in a single step. In his three-volume book, The Mutations Theory, as a counterpoint to Darwin's theory that gradual changes occur within a single lineage over many generations as an adaptive response to natural selection. De Vries also thought that all unitary mutations were produced by a common mechanism. Both of these ideas were later disproven by other geneticists. Why is that? As we shall see, these kinds of errors and blatant misrepresentations are present in every piece of re research and every article presented on talk origins. Yes, and exactly that is the reason why we should listen to Mr. Does It Fail 101, I mean Does It Tap 101, and his intellectual honesty. Yeah, right. It is clear that the authors of talk origins have either no scientific education or are not interested in intellectual honesty. Talk.Origins is a news group that holds the discussions about our origins. Its participants consist of people like Aaron Ra and many PhDs from biology, genetics and stuff like that. So, yes, I think that those people might know what they are talking about. And about intellectual integrity, well... I think that you are the last one to talk about it. What they are doing here is a fallacy called proof by verbosity. That is, an attempt to con the readers of the site into accepting their arguments by presenting so many studies that the reader is overwhelmed with seemingly reliable information, thus blindly accepts their arguments of the authors without checking the word. Oh, who can be described like that? I know of a person... I don't really know how it's called. Does it fail? Does it fail up? Does it end up? Does it end up one on one? Nah, nah, can't be. Therefore, to avoid an argument from verbosity, I would like to propose a simple criteria for posting instances of observed speciation. The person posting any kind of evidence must post the name of the old species. And the, and the new species which was formed. I think this is a reasonable request to at least begin to separate the junk from the reliable information. What the hell? We already know how to distinct species, but apparently you never managed to look it up. So, look it up. You don't really need to use Google Scholar or something like that. Just open Wikipedia page or maybe, I don't know, book about biology? Maybe? I uh, go through some of the other studies on talk origins and uh, just show how they do not show observed instances of speciation. Crap, on this channel I still have one more minute, so I'll try to make it quick. And yes, the red remarks are mine. In most cases, he never bothered to read uh, the entire paper. In reality, if you didn't bother to read the entire 
paper, you would just fail at biology. That's about it.